19. Psalm 19, and we started studying uh, a couple weeks ago uh, through the Psalms, and we're not going to cover all of them, obviously. Uh, we're going to co- cover a few of them that I've uh, kind of picked out and selected, and uh, lyrics for life is what we call this, and tonight I'm going to cover, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> we might cover. <laughs> we'll get the he'll get it to us here in just a second. But tonight we're gonna cover Psalm 19. And title of the lesson tonight is just this God's beneficial word. Uh God's beneficial word. Uh aren't you thankful for the word of God tonight? You know I am, and uh it, it's a book that will will revolutionize our lives and change our lives and guide our lives and, and help us in so many ways if we'll just allow it to. And uh, if we want to look at that tonight, uh, David writes in this psalm about the revelation of God in nature. That's kind of how he starts this chapter out. And um, now again, he, and he kind of alludes to the fact that every every nation, every tongue can see God in nature. If they're really open, open-minded, open-hearted about it. But he doesn't stop there. Then he continues the psalm and he ends the psalm on the thought that uh, that's a limited revelation of God through nature. Then he ends it with an unlimited revelation of God through Scripture. Uh, and how, how if you read Scripture, uh, it's so beneficial in the lives of believers that you can learn so much. Um, just, just a quick question here for you tonight. We'll jump into the outline. Maybe I should skip this, but we'll, we'll go through real quick. Um, I'm going to give you a list of things. I want you to tell me what they're beneficial for. Tylenol. All right, release headaches. Tums. All right. Penicillin. All right, you guys are you guys are like doctors, fruits and vegetables, uh, nourishment, yeah, health, oatmeal, fiber, and they but they say oatmeal even reduces cholesterol. Nyquil, <laughs> Nyquil helps you go to sleep, right? Uh, Dayquil, not so much. Don't take Dayquil at nighttime, or you'll be in trouble. But uh, and that's just a small list, kind of a sample of some things that we all we all know very well. But uh, there's beneficial things with each one of those. Now, I know there's also probably some side effects with those things as well. Have you ever read the side effects and it's worse than the, than the symptoms? Um, so we, we know that. But uh, we appreciate the products and the foods that have benefits to them. You know, I'm so thankful for the Bible. And, of course, Psalm 19 teaches us that with God's word, it's always beneficial. And negative side effects with some medicine that have some positive things as well. But the word of God is nothing negative other than when it's dealing with my heart sometimes, amen? Uh, and so we want to look at the beneficial word of God tonight. Uh, the title of Psalm 19, if you look at it again, if you have that in your scripture here, we're going to read, we're going to do like you did last week and go through the scripture with the points. Uh, but it says to the chief musician, a Psalm of David. Uh, so David is the author here. And just like Psalm 8, it was probably written uh, to, the, to the minister of music, if you will, probably used in temple time worship uh, as, a, as a song that they may have sung. Uh, and, and kind of like Psalm 8 was. And he uses some of the language um, that, that when he spoke in 1 Kings chapter 2 as the king, uh, he uses the same kind of language. So it may have been written about that time of his life. It's not tied to a specific event like some of the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 8 wasn't either. This one isn't tied to a specific event in his life, but it may be, if you read 1 Kings 2, the first few verses, you kind of see some similarities. So it may have been written around the same time as that. Uh, so let's look at our, our outline tonight. We'll get into the scripture as well as we read. Uh, we, lo- we saw last week, um, the, the two lessons before, uh, the very important one, the first one was uh, relating uh, biblical truth to life and how important that was in Psalm 1. Psalm 8, we saw praising God for his undeserved attention. Amen? We don't deserve it. We're sure we're thankful for it. Tonight, uh, as we look at God's beneficial word, we'll get back to that screen in a minute and add our third point. Uh, but we're going to look at number one. He starts the chapter with the revelation of God in nature. The revelation of God in nature. And you see about the first six verses of this, uh, you see him explaining this to us tonight. So uh, as we look at this, I'll break it down again. We'll read the scripture as we go. The revelation of God in nature starts with, I want to look at this point, the extent of the message. This is not a, a, uh, I'm going to say three words. This is a pretty extensive thing that he says as he declares uh, God's revelation in nature. Look at verse one through four. And I have up here on the screen here for you. Um, the Bible says this, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. We'll stop right there because we're going to pick it back up in the next thought. 
these first few verses of, of Psalm 19, David is kind of catching us up with the revelation of God in, in what we call nature. Uh, the first four verses specifically, uh, they're an excellent uh, picture uh, or example of Hebrew poetry. Uh, these are some of the, this, this, this is the way they would speak. Okay, now we probably don't speak this way in, you know, 2021, right? I doubt anybody in here has ever used the word uttereth. Okay, unless you were reading, unless you were reading scripture, okay? Uh, even handiwork, you know, is probably something we don't say too often. So it's a great, uh, excellent uh, example of Hebrew poetry. Uh, and, and so David uses that. Uh, it talks about the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, if you think about the heavens, what's in the heavens? Yeah, what else? Planets, the moon, galaxies. You're missing the big one. The sun, yeah. The heavens are not empty. There, there are things in the heavens. The sun and the moon and the stars, the, the, the galaxies, the planets. And if you think about it, they all reveal the glory of God. Uh, we says, uh, verse number one, it says we see his handiwork. Think about, think about how all that came into being. It wasn't constructed by human hands. Uh, this was spoken into existence by God. And it's his handiwork. Uh, it's what he did. All during the day and night, the heavenly bodies speak about God. You can go out during the day and see that beautiful sun and thank God for it. Thank God for the 10 minutes of rain. <laughs> Amen? We need about 10 days more, right? But, but the 10 minutes was wonderful. Uh, you know, you go at night and you see those beautiful stars out and you start picking out the, uh, uh, the constellations and, and they're like, wow. So, so it doesn't matter what time of day it is, creation or nature uh, speaks of God's glory. It reveals God to us. Uh, the verb in verse number two, uttereth. I mentioned that. I kind of joked about it. Really. You know what the word uttereth means? I love this. You know what uttereth means? Heidi, you're on the right track. It, it, it means to bubble forth. You, you ever seen that kid's song? Oh, Donna, come up here and teach it to us. It's bubbling. It's bubbling. You ever seen that one? It's bubbling in my soul. It's singing and laughing. Said Jesus. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all looking like I'm an alien up here. <laughs> and folks don't understand it. I cannot keep it quiet. It's bubbling, 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 bubbling deep inside. This is what the word uttereth mean. Day unto day, uh, night unto night, his handiwork bubbles forth the revelation of God, uh, the knowledge of God. The created beings are continually speaking about God without saying a word. Uh, anthropologists calculate there are over 6,000 languages and dialects in the world. You realize that every language, every dialect, every person can have a revelation of God simply through nature, regardless of where they are or what language they speak. God reaches all people. His message is equally intelligible to all simply through nature. A person who is blind or deaf can still learn about God from nature by using their other senses. Uh, and so, so God is being revealed to us in nature. And that's the first thing David says. Uh, men and women, we, we, we understand God's eternal power in his deity. And because of that, through nature, we stand without excuse, really. If that's all we had. That's enough to point to a creator. Uh, and so, so we see that David does that, the example of nature. Uh, secondly, and uh, we see this in the next few verses here. Oh, I can't get it to click. Larry's going to have to, Larry's gonna have to take over. All right. The, next, you see the example of the sun. Uh, this is an easy one there. But uh, you see the example of the sun in verse 4 through 6. Uh, if you look at Scripture there, we'll read the end of verse 4 and then go down to verse number 6. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Boy, what a fitting verse for the last couple of weeks in Arizona. Uh, you can't hide from the sun, amen? But uh, David, we don't know exa exactly, unless, he, unless you know, he specifies, we don't know exactly why he writes what he writes, but I believe everything in the Word of God is there for a reason. I think David may have directed that thought about the sun uh, to the pagans in the ancient Near East uh, who worshipped the sun. And so it may have been a little jab at them. We don't know for sure. Uh, but he points out the fact that even the sun uh, reveals God to us. Uh, the revelation of God in nature, and he uses the sun and the heavenly bodies and the perspective of them. Uh, in the heavens, he says, God has established a tabernacle, a place for the sun. Every day, you know what comes up? 
the sun. You know what it doesn't have to look for? A place to go. God gave it the heavens. That's, that's where it goes. And God did that for us. And it goes up and then it goes down. And it goes from the ends of the earth to the other ends of the earth. Do you realize, uh, other than Alaska every now and then, uh, and Russia sometimes, but do you realize that everyone experiences the sun? No, it may not be in the same degree to, uh, uh, of heat as different places because of placement upon the globe and all that. I understand that. But the sun is, is inclusive of all people. Everyone can experience that. And so David uses this as a way to say, hey, this is teaching us uh, about the, the revelation of God. Uh, he uses a couple of images about the sun. And the first one he tells us is the son is pictured as a bridegroom leaving his chamber on the day of his wedding, eager to meet his bride. That's a pretty vivid picture, isn't it? He says, that's what the son is like. The son gets up in the morning and it rises to say, I want to glorify God today. Now you say, pastor, that's an inanimate object. He can't speak. Why is the son in existence? Because God said so. Why did God create everything? To bring him glory. And so when that sun rises in the morning, it's to say, hey, look at me. I'm here to point people to Christ. You remember, hey guys, do you remember the day you got married? How many of you remember that day? All right? Men. I should ask the men specifically. How many of you men remember the day you got married? How many of you, no, I'm not going to ask you. I'm just going to ask you. You remember, uh, and I don't know how your wedding was conducted necessarily, but I remember mine. I was standing all the way at the front of the church. And my, and my bride was coming in the very back of the church. And she's walking down the aisle under the arch, you know, with her dad coming to give her away. And I'll never, I'll never forget. I'm standing up there. My knees are knocking. My palms are sweating. I got sweat dripping down my face. She probably got there and said, babe, you stunk. You should have took a shower before you got married. But... And I'll never remember the excitement and the anticipation of getting to meet my bride that day. Now, we did it the old-fashioned way. I didn't see her the morning before we got married. I never saw her in her dress until she walked down that aisle. Uh, and, and, and I remember the smile on my face. The video probably shows it. And then the tear that kind of ran down. And then, oh, you know. What an exciting time. And David says, you know what? That's a picture of the sun. Every time it gets up and says, hey, look at me, this is because of God. It's amazing what Scripture can teach us if we'll just read it and really study it and apply some of these verses. So the first picture is this image of the, uh, of the bridegroom. The second is picture is a champion runner who's eager to start the race. You ever been in an athletic competition you were pretty sure you were going to win? It's a lot more exciting to start when you think you're going to win, Amen. If you're worried about finishing or worried about winning, you're like, oh, I'm not so sure. But man, when you think, I got this, you're like, I'm going to smoke all these dudes. It's a lot more exciting, isn't it? You let the sun, just eager to rise every morning and point people to Christ. Just like that championship runner that's compared to. The picture of the sun is eager every day to come up and begin declaring God's glory once again. That's nature. That's the example of the sun. David concludes the section by commenting the extent of God's revelation. Just as no place escapes the heat of the sun, we saw that in verse 6, right? No place escapes the heat of the sun. If you think about it, no part of the world escapes the knowledge of God. You hear people ask the question, um, what about people who don't have the Bible in their language? How will they get saved? Can they get saved? Does not nature itself point us to a Savior? Now, I understand situations and circumstances are different, and maybe what's accomplished in their heart is a little bit different than us in America. I get all that. But nature itself leads people to Christ if they're willing to have an open eye and an open mind. And just like you can't escape the heat of the sun, you can't escape nature pointing people to Christ. So that's the revelation of God in, in nature. Number two, number two, look at the revelation of God in Scripture. And again, here's where we get into uh, more of God's beneficial word. The revelation of God in Scripture he concludes this chapter, uh, verse 7 through 14, uh, and he talks about how God is shown in the Word of God, the Bible, his, his Word. And he uses a lot of different terminology for that. We're going to look at that. Uh, look at, first of all, the benefits of God's Word. The benefits of God's Word. Look at verse 7 through 9. We'll read that real quick, and then I'll give you some thoughts here. The benefits of God's Word. Look at verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Uh, David here, he had just mused on God being revealed to us in nature. And now he's saying, 
we even have greater clarification and greater revelation about God through the scriptures. Uh, through the scriptures. And there's beneficial effects for the scriptures in the life of the believer. David in these three verses uses six names for scriptures. Each name is slightly has a different has a slightly different nuance than the other, slightly different meaning than the other. And together they're all synonyms of different ways to refer to scripture. Look at them with me real quick. These are going to be small, so you might have to squint, okay? Um, and I don't think they're on your paper here, but to get them all on, I had to make them really small, okay? The first one is law. What is the law? Many people think, oh, that's the Mosaic law. That's the Pentateuch. That's the first five books. Well, that's the Ten Commandments. This is referring to all scriptural truth. All scripture. You realize if God says it, it's law. Does that make sense? So it's referring to all scriptural truth. The second one he gives us is, is, is testimony. Testimony. This is God's witness or presentation of truth. Uh, by the way, God can't present falsehood. Amen? And, and so the testimony is referred to. The third word is statutes. Statutes. This refers to uh, God's uh, the responsibility that God gives to his people. Uh, these are the, the, the do's and the don'ts, if you will, uh, of Scripture. He used a similar word in statutes. He uses the word commandments. Commandments. And, of course, that's that same philosophy, that same thought, uh, responsibilities that God gives us. Uh, and then he uses another one. He uses the word uh, judgments. Oh, sorry, fear of the Lord is first. Fear of the Lord. If you read Scripture, okay, and you truly read it for what it's worth, and you meditate upon it, and you apply it, it ought to bring us into a fear of the Lord. And, again, this is not a cowering, I'm scared of God. This is an awe and a reverence because he's so awesome. All right? And, and Scripture will do that to us. It's an effect that God's word has on us, the fear of the Lord. The last one is judgments. This is God's judicial decisions. Everything God judges is, is true, is right, is holy, and is righteous. And so those are the ones that, that David gives us in those three verses. Now, I want to give you quickly the description of each here real quick. We'll run down through these. It says the law is perfect. The law is perfect. That's, that is um, flawless and complete. Flawless and complete. The testimonies are sure. That means they're reliable. They're trustworthy. Uh, the third one, he says, is the statutes are right. That word right, it means morally straight. Proverbs 8.8 8 describes God's word as not being froward or crooked. Any path that God takes you down is a straight path. It's a right path. Uh, he never leads you to the wrong way, never to a path of destruction. It's always straight. Uh, the commandments are pure. That word pure there, it means without error or alloy. Uh, you know what alloy is? Alloy. You know what that is? Okay, all right. Um, if you were to purify gold, what do you remove from it? Impurities. All the other metal alloys that might be mixed in. What it's saying is this. God's commandments are pure. There are no errors. There are no imperfections or impurities. What God says is 100% true and 100% right and 100% accurate. Uh, he, he uses the next one, fear of the Lord, or clean. Again, no impurities, without spot. And then it says his judgments are true, utterly dependable, utterly dependable. You ever had a person in your life that was utterly dependable? You probably have had one, one or two maybe. <laughs> you know, they're hard to find, but you knew you'd count on them no matter what. You realize you can count on God's word no matter what. You need an answer, it's in there. You've got to find it. You might have to dig for it, but it's there. And it's, it's utterly dependable. Now, how does that benefit us? How does it benefit us? Look at the last column here. The law that is perfect converts the soul. It converts the soul. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it means it gives life to an unsaved person. But secondly, to the child of God, it means it revives our weak spirit. You ever felt weak as a child of God? Ever been there? What does the law of God that is perfect do? It restores or converts the soul. It brings that back to us. Uh, the testimonies that are sure, the Bible says, make wise the simple. It imparts... Um, it imparts wisdom to a humble heart. It imparts wisdom to a humble heart. What does the Bible say about wisdom? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which abradeth not and giveth to all men liberally. This is the only time I like the word liberal, amen? He gives it, he gives it liberally. We'll ask for it. Well, how do we, how, well, some of the ways we ask for it, but we, we, we get into God's word and we study it. So those sure testimonies make wise the simple. I don't know about you. I'd, I'd much rather be wise in God's eyes than wise in man's eyes. And how do we do that? We accomplish that through the word of God. The statutes that are right cause rejoicing in the heart. What does that mean? It brings encouragement. You ever read the word of God and close it up and it's like, this felt good. 
Man, that was encouraging. That's exact. You ever open it up? Hopefully you have a, you maybe have a system, I'm sure, to what you read. But you ever open the Word of God and you read that system, that passage, whatever you have in line for today, and you read that and you're like, that's exactly what I needed today. Isn't that awesome? What does it do? It rejoices the heart. Why? Because the statutes are right. And David is saying, hey, the Word of God is beneficial to the child of God. The next one he shows us is the commandments that are pure enlightens the eyes. They give guidance. They give guidance and direction. They open our eyes to things that we humanly may not see. He opens our spiritual eyes to see through the word of God. Uh, and so that's the, uh, the, uh, the, the commandments that are pure and lighten the eyes. Getting guidance from scripture. God's word shines the light on a dark path. What, what does the Bible say in Psalm, I think it's Psalm 119? Uh, Thy word is a light unto, uh, light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. Or vice versa, lamp unto my feet, light unto my path, whatever. Isn't that true? It guides us. It guides us. David says, listen, this is not just some book. It's not just some words. It's not just some commandments. These are awesome benefits for the child of God. The fear of the Lord that is clean, the Bible says, endures forever. It endures forever. This is retaining value. And if it retains value, it gives confidence. Would you buy something from somebody that they told you in in 30 years it's going to be worth three times as much? You buy that rather than, if you buy this, it might be worth more in a few years and it might depreciate, it might be worth a whole lot. You have much more confidence buying something you know is going to last and endure, right? That's the word of God. That's what it does for the child of God. The last one, the judgments that are true, uh, the Bible says they uh, make us righteous altogether. They're righteous altogether. That means that God's word leads us to live a righteous life. Uh, leads us to make righteous choices, have, have righteous wisdom, uh, make righteous decisions, all in the Word of God. It's pretty, pretty good benefits, if you ask me. Uh, and so that's, that's, the, that's the first thing, as he, he shows us the benefits of God's Word. And then the second thing, he shows us the value of God's Word. How important is it? What is it worth? Uh, look at verse, uh, verse 10 and 11 here real quick. Look at verse 10 and 11. See, I got it up here for you. Yep. More to be desired... Are they than what? Gold. Hold on. He doesn't stop there. He gives a further description. Yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than what? Honey. But hold on. He doesn't stop there either. And the honeycomb. Moreover, by them as thy servant warned, and in keeping of them, there is great reward. The value of the word of God. David once again uses imagery. Uh, he's, he's a pretty smart writer, okay? And of course, I know he's inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. I get all that, but pretty smart. What does he do? He gives us pictures. He says this, God's word is more desirable than pure gold. Not just gold, pure gold. Purified. Uh, special, special gold. That gold that uh, is, is, is fine gold. And then he says it's, it's sweeter uh, than the sweetest honey. How many of you like honey? All right. Uh, would you rather have honey in a jar that you buy at Walmart or honey right out of the honeycomb? Woo, it's good, isn't it? <laughs> and so David knows what he's doing. This picture that he pays for, he says, honey is sweet, and the word of God is sweeter than honey, but it's even sweeter than honey right out of the comb, buddy. It, it is good stuff. He said that's the, that's the value of the word of God. Uh, it's sweeter than honey. It's uh, the, the honey right out of the comb, and it's more desirable than pure gold. Uh, and so he teaches that in scripture. Uh, look at look, a couple of thoughts here for you. How does God's word become so desirable and sweet to us? If David says it is that, how do we how do we make that happen? All right, meditate on it. What else? Study it. What else? Believe it. Obey it. <laughs> I, I put down a series, just a series of a phrase here. First of all, by knowing the benefits of it, which we just covered through the seven or the six descriptions David gave us. Uh, secondly, by experiencing the benefits. It, it's a different thing to know something and to experience something. I can tell you something, and you're like, next time somebody asks, I know the answer. But when you experience it, it's different. And, and so how do we? How does this happen? We know it, we experience it. Uh, thirdly, uh, by getting to know God through his word. We start to understand how sweet his word is, how desirable it is, because the more we know about his word, the more we know about him. And that's how it works in our lives. Uh, next, by seeing God's work all around us. Does he not work around us on a daily basis? You bet he does. Recognizing that in our lives. And then lastly, I put down by allowing God's word to change us. Um, God's word can cut to the quick sometimes, amen? 
And it can show me the areas of my life that I need to work on. And when I allow it to change me, I realize how desirable it really is. And I realize how sweet it really is. In verse 11, he identifies two more benefits. I don't have them on the screen here for you tonight. Uh, two more values of the word of God. He says, first, it's the value of being warned. Verse 11 says, moreover by them as thy servant warned. Uh, God is clearly warning the Israelites, if you disobey me, my righteous anger will come out. Okay. However, if you obey me, what will you experience? My, my wonderful blessings, right? Now, again, God is not being mean when he gives us warnings like this. Uh, quite the opposite is true. His warnings are valuable because they help us to understand the seriousness of sin, how much God hates it, and they motivate us to obey him more. Uh, a mean God would hide the consequences of sin so he could dole out punishment. God says, I'll use my word to warn you. And David points that out in verse 11. Uh, that more of that servant warn. And then secondly, at the end of that verse 11, and keeping it in there is great reward. Obedience to God's word brings the promise of blessing and reward. Uh, God warns the children and then he says, and by the way, if you do obey, you, you get blessings. You, you get blessed for your obedience. Now, I know, I know as God's church, we, we can't necessarily claim some of the blessings that he promised to Israel. Uh, but ultimately, we have a lot of blessings promised to the child of God, either now or in eternity, simply through one word, obedience. And so he points it out to us in Scripture. And David says, man, the word of God is beneficial, but it's also valuable to the child of God. Let me get this last thought. Let her see. Let us see, look at the response to God's word. He closes this in verse 12 through 14 with the response to God's word. Uh, look at the scripture here. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them ha not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What are the, what's the response to God's word? If it's beneficial and it's valuable, how does it really affect us then? What is the response it can have in our lives? Well, let me give you two. First of all, it helps us to overcome sin. It helps us to overcome sin. I, I write in uh, Bibles often, uh, especially to our, college, or our high school graduates. I'll write in the Bible a phrase, and I, it's not my phrase. I stole it from somebody who stole it from somebody who stole it from somebody. But I, all, I always write, sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but it sure will help you make, avoid making some stupid mistakes. That's, that's the response that God's valuable, beneficial word has in our life. It helps us to overcome sin. Uh, God's word uh, demands a response. You can't be neutral. You either do or you don't. Uh, you can't just agree that it's beneficial and, and it's valuable. Then you do something with it. David says, I'm going to use it to overcome sin. I'm going to use it to overcome sin. Verse number 12, he says, who can understand his errors? Who can understand his errors? The obvious answer is nobody, right? Do you always, do you always know when you, when you do wrong? <laughs> Most of the time. But, you know, I've done some things, and maybe some points, I never even thought about that. Or I read scripture, I'm like, oh, especially a new child, of, a, new, a newborn child of God, right? They're doing things, and they're like, oh, I didn't know that was wrong, <laughs> you know? And you show them in scripture, oh, you know? We, we're not always aware. You know, because sometimes we think, we think of committing sin, Sometimes our sins of omission. We don't do something we should, and God looks at it and says, that's sin. Sometimes we're not always aware of those things. And so to understand all my sin, it's, it's very, very tough because our spiritual life is complex. Uh, and so David says, I want to cover my secret sins, those unintentional things that maybe even are on my radar. I want the word of God to speak to me in those areas. Uh, I want the word of God to have a cleansing effect so I see those things and I, and I avoid them. He also mentions in verse, uh, 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 verse number 13, he talks about presumptuous sins. You ever done something you flat out knew was wrong and you did it anyways? <laughs> Been there, done that, and got the t-shirt, right? We, we've done it. These are presumptuous sins, blatantly committed even though we knew they were wrong. David says, God, use your word to break that habit in my life. Don't let, that, don't let that bind me. Don't let that chain me down. Don't let me keep recommitting that. Show me the error. Forgive me of it. And help God's word to teach me to avoid it in the future. By the way, hiding, this is why we talk about hiding God's word in your heart. That I might not sin against thee. This is so valuable, the word of God. Uh, David says, if I if I'll apply the word of God to help it overcome sin, I will stand before him upright. 
upright. Again, that's not perfect. It's not, not blameless. What he's saying is this. Uh, 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 it's the end of verse number 13. He says, I should be innocent from the great transgression. I think what David is saying is this. If I can use God's word to overcome little sins in my life, which I know all sin is equal, but you know what I'm saying. We categorize it. If I can use God's word to help me overcome some of the small ones, I might not fall into the big doozy. Right? Which he did. We know that. Okay. And he got his heart right. But, but if, we, if, we, if we work on the small things, we might not fall into the, what he labeled as the, the great transgression. And that's what David says. That's what the word of God can do for us. Secondly, the second response is then it helps us to live a godly life. He ends verse 14, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. What I say and what I think, I want you to be pleased with it. I want it to be acceptable in your sight. David's uh, response there is to live an acceptable life before God by applying the truths of God's word to his life. Uh, David desired to replace old sinful habits with new words and new thoughts that please the Lord. Uh, think about that. Not just my words, but my thoughts. I want to please the Lord. Uh, God would renew David's words and thoughts as David spent time reading, studying, meditating, and applying God's word. And he does the same thing for us today. Uh, the, the whole bring it all down tonight is just this. You know, give you the last thought here. Uh, just enjoy the benefits of God's word. They're there for us. You know, if somebody walked up and said, I've got $500 sitting out here for you, all you have to do is take it. Are you dumb enough to say, nah, I'm good? <laughs> You're probably going to ask about the catches, right? God's word is beneficial, and it's right there. But how many times, myself included, do I tote this old bad boy to church, and I open it up, and I read with the sermon, and then I go home on Sunday night, and I, and I, and I miss out on all the benefits to the week? <laughs> Y'all with me? Just enjoy the benefits of God. If they're there for you, and they're free, by the way. <laughs> Don't cost you a thing. Enjoy them. Enjoy them. Uh, we, uh, we know that medicine and food, we talked about at the beginning of our lesson, has benefits. How do those benefits get into our life? What do you have to do with the medicine and the food? <laughs> you have to take it. You have to eat it. You have to swallow it. Whatever. Uh, you have to take God's word to yourself. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Paul said to the Colossians. Uh, study it, memorize it. Bottom of your outline, I'll run through these real fast. I'm just, actually, I'm going to put them all up here, okay? I'm going to put them all up here real fast. I put down the word beneficial. Believe the word. Expand your effort to be in the word. Never give up. You ever make a, you ever make a New Year's resolution? I'm going to read the Bible every day this year. In about day 23, you forget or day four, <laughs> or day two, and so oh, I blew it. I'll just get back on the horse. Never give up. Enter each day in the Word. Start your morning, if if, you, if at all possible. Start your morning in the Word. Uh, let it start speaking to you early, early, early. Number uh, letter F is form the habit of being in the Word. Make it, make it. You know, it takes thirty days to make a habit out of something. Uh, anybody chew their fingernails? <laughs> Roger. <laughs> About 30 days into doing that, it became a habit, all right? It takes a lot longer to break a habit than to form a habit. Form the habit of being in the Word. Indulge in the Word. Don't just, don't just look at it. Don't just, I got to read my chapter. And I'm not, indulge in it. Crave the Word. Crave the Word. Uh, uh, be in, uh, in <laughs> I didn't even spell the word right. <laughs> Integrate the Word into your life. Again, read it, study it, memorize it, but then, then apply it. Allow it to be part of your life. Adapt your life to God's word. If God says change, change. If God says go, go. If God says don't, don't. And the last one there is love the word. Love the word. That's the beneficial word of God. And the more we apply those things to our life in our relationship with the word of God, the more we'll enjoy and reap the benefits of the word of God. Uh, have a time and a place to daily spend in God's word. And then have a backup plan and a backup plan in case that first one fails. Because inevitably it will at some point. Uh, and, and enjoy the word of God. Next week, we're going to be in Psalm 23, a familiar psalm, short psalm. And we're going to look at God's abundant provisions. And we talked about his, his undeserved attention last, uh, last week. And we're going to look at how he provides for us in such a wonderful way as our great shepherd. And uh, so that's where we'll be next week. So your homework is to read Psalm 23 27 times. I'm just kidding. You probably could. It's not a big deal. But... Uh, uh, so next week, read it through a time or two and get familiar with the uh, phrasing 
uh, of Psalm 23, and that's where we'll pick up next week. All right, we got our blanks filled in. Questions, comments, thoughts? Can we read some more uh, wordy parts of the... I'm just kidding. All right. Um, all right, I'm going to close with a word of prayer. Uh, when I'm done praying, I just thought, I don't know if you noticed when you pulled it, I moved the bus over here. I had to go do some stuff to it today, so it's moved over here. Uh, I have the key on me. If anybody would like to see the inside of the bus, nobody's even been in it, uh, other than maybe one or two people. So if you'd like to see it, I'll open it up after church. You can go and take a tour of it, because our, our seniors are going to be taking a trip here real soon. You have it? You have what? You have to say two things. Okay, I have to say one thing first. Hold on. I'm trying to remember what she told me I had to say. Hold on, give me one second, and I'll remember. I promise, I promise. What? The lunch thing. We're canceling that? I need to say it? It's still on. Okay. And you're okay with Donna on that? Friday night, game night, fellowship, family fellowship, be here. We're playing games. Oh, sorry. I have it. I'll go in with you. Yes. And you're okay with them having lunch? That's what I was, that was my other thing. Yes? You sure? Okay. All right, we'll move them outside. Okay. Okay, all right. Okay. Sean will tell you what to do. She's good at it. Okay. Some people... St- some people stay after church on Sunday mornings, bring their lunch, and eat over in Fellowship Hall and Fellowship. So if, if you don't, it's because you haven't been invited because they don't like you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. It's an open invitation. It started, it started last year on the, on the porch of the Murphy House is where we started it. And then it got hot, so we moved to the Fellowship Hall, and we've just been doing it. And not everybody stays every week, and it's a different group sometimes. But anytime you want to bring a lunch, stay and eat, fellowship for a while, go home. So, Yeah. Don't forget your lunch, Roger. And if you have extra, Roger will take it. So just so you know. <laughs> Amen. All right. Let's pray. And uh, we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you. We thank you for your blessings in our life. Uh, thank you for the word of God, Lord. It is so important and so valuable, uh, so beneficial to the child of God if we truly will uh, claim it and use it and believe it and apply it like we should. Uh, Lord, it truly will revolutionize our lives. Help us to do so, I pray. Uh, Father, as we go home tonight, give us safety, please, as we travel. Uh, Bless us the remainder of this week. Bless the activities this weekend, Lord, the uh, fellowship Friday. Lord, give us a good attendance, a good crowd, a good spirit. And we have a lot of fun, Lord, as we meet together with your people and just outside of a church service and just uh, just have some fun, Lord. Bless that time and guide it, we pray. Uh, The baby shower, Lord, on Sunday. Uh, Lord, the services, of course. We just pray that you'll be in everything we do this week. And uh, may we live for you and point people to you uh, this week, I pray. We ask all these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Goodbye. God bless you. Shake a hand or two. See you on Friday.